this video exercise, we will follow on from our previous receptor grid generation series in which we produced a receptor grid for the 1FJS structure by carrying out the ligand docking stage using the ligand docking panel. So if you plan on following along, you may want to review the previous grid generation panel videos. Now to launch the ligand docking panel from within Maestro, just go to Tasks, Docking, Glide Docking. Or if you're in the Applications view mode, go to Applications, Glide, Ligand Docking. Or search for it in the task tree. Now in the first part of this exercise, we're going to dock a set of ligands into the 1FJS Factor 10A binding site using the receptor grid we generated previously. We'll cover the fundamentals first before we follow up with any additional videos that may explain some of the other settings like incorporating constraints. The settings tab defines the basic options for docking ligands such as specifying the grid, selecting the level of docking precision and setting flexibility options. So let's begin by specifying the receptor grid by clicking browse and choosing the grid file we generated previously. Now to confirm this is the grid file for the Factor 10A structure, we can optionally check on the display receptor checkbox to show the receptor we'll be docking into. There are multiple choices of docking precision listed here in the precision menu. Now they're quite important to understand, so let's cover them in some detail. HTVS or high throughput virtual screening is a docking method intended for the rapid screening of very large numbers of ligands, like a database with millions of compounds. It has much more restricted conformational sampling than other sampling methods like SP docking. Note that HTVS cannot be used with score in place and the advanced settings are not available as they are predetermined. SP or standard precision is a docking method that is appropriate for screening ligands of unknown quality in large numbers. It is essentially the same algorithm as the HTVS scoring function, but without the restrictions in the number of intermediate conformations or the reduction in thoroughness of the final torsional refinement and sampling that is seen in HTVS. XP, or extra precision, is designed to be a more powerful and discriminating procedure in which it starts with SP sampling, but then also follows up with its own anchor and grow procedure for more extensive sampling. It therefore takes longer to run than SP. XP also employs a more sophisticated scoring function that is harder than SP docking, with greater requirements of ligand shape complementarity. This weeds out false positives that SP may let through. And because XP can penalize ligands that don't fit well into a particular receptor conformation used, we recommend docking to multiple receptor conformations if possible. Also, when performing virtual screening on a large database of ligands, we recommend that you first carry out docking using SP before taking the top 10 to 30% of your final poses and re-docking them with XP. This strategy allows you to perform the more expensive docking simulation on worthwhile ligands. Note that when you choose XP mode, you have the option for writing the XP descriptor information. This will allow you to later on use the XP visualizer to analyze the poses in greater detail and visualize key rewarding interactions like hydrophobic enclosure or penalties like close contacts. But note, you must have a separate license for this feature. Now, if you want to dock ligands using a progression of precision, like going from HTVS to SP to XP, then you may want to use the virtual screening workflow. SP peptide or standard precision docking for peptide ligands uses the same general settings as for regular standard precision but with changes to some of the settings to enhance pose retention such that it is optimized for peptide docking. Now in this exercise we'll use SP docking. In the ligand sampling section we have the options to choose whether ligands are docked flexibly or rigidly, refined in place or simply scored in place. The default is for flexible docking, where conformation generation is limited to variations around acyclic torsion bonds and pyramidal nitrogen inversions, such as in amines and sulfon amides. On by default is the option to sample inversion at pyramidal nitrogen atoms, as well as to sample ring conformations, where only low energy conformations are kept. Here you can choose to include the original ring conformation. Here we have the option to buy sampling of the torsion around bonds that normally adopt a particular conformation, for example amides and esters. And these options cover different selections of functional groups. So the first option would bias the torsion sampling for a set of functional groups that is defined in a resource file. More info can be found in the Glide user manual. 
The second option will bias the sampling of torsions around the carbon-nitrogen bond of amides only, and where you can penalize non-planar conformations, which will apply penalties to amide bonds that are not cis or trans, rather than freezing them entirely, retain original conformations, which will fix amide bonds in their input conformation, or all trans conformation only, which will enforce the trans conformation to within a small angle range, about 20 degrees. Ligands that do not dock in a transformation are rejected. Here, we'll leave it on the default settings, which is to simply penalize non-planar amide bond conformations. Of course, there is also the none option, which will not apply any biasing, but instead allow the conformation to be determined by the conformation generated via the force field. The rigid docking option does not generate conformations of the input ligand, but only allows the input conformation of the ligand to be translated and rigidly rotated relative to the binding site. This may be useful if you generated ligand conformers outside of Glide, such as in Macromodel, which unlike Glide does not have a rotatable bond sampling limit. There are also two options for not performing any sampling at all. These options are not substitutes for a full docking calculation, and both require accurate initial placement of the ligand with respect to the receptor. The refine only option uses the input ligand coordinates to perform an optimization of the ligand structure in the field of the receptor, and then the ligand is scored. The goal of this method is to find the best scoring pose that is geometrically similar to the input pose. If you're using HTVS or SP, a minimization is performed, or for XP, the ligand is regrown in place. The score in place option similarly does not perform docking but uses the input ligand coordination position for scoring. This option is useful to score the native ligand in its co-crystallized or modeled position, or as a post-processing step on glide-generated poses to obtain individual components of the glide score prediction of the binding affinity. It can also be used to check whether the scores of the known binders in their native proteins are similar enough to the scores when cross-stocked to the chosen receptor. And if this is the case, it is reasonable to expect that similar structures would also score well. Keep in mind, scoring in place should not be used with Glide XP, as full XP sampling is normally needed to avoid strong XP penalties for ligands that should be able to dock correctly. Here we have the option to add epic state penalties to the docking score. This is on by default so that when ligands that have been prepared using epic for ionization and tautomerization, the epic penalties for adopting higher energy states, including those where metals are present, are added to the docking score. This can have significant implications for improving binding mode discrimination and virtual screening enrichments, so you always want to keep this on when the ligands have been prepared with lig prep and EPIC. Here we have the option to add a reward for each intramolecular hydrogen bond to the glide score, as well as in the E model to favor selection of poses with intramolecular hydrogen bonds. This may be important in binding for some ligands, such as those that form the intramolecular hydrogen bonds, thus paying a smaller entropic penalty upon binding. This option here is to enhance planarity of conjugated pi groups by increasing the energetic penalty for non-planarity. It is essentially a means of making aromatic rings, amides, esters, and other sp2 atoms less likely to adopt a non-planar geometry. This option is off by default as these groups can adopt non-planar geometry. Indeed, what may look like distorted aromatic rings are not necessarily unphysical because of the out-of-plane bending mode frequencies are not infinite. Nonetheless, checking this option should help keep rings planar. If the grid that you chose contains excluded volume data, you can choose to apply the excluded volumes when docking the ligands. This option allows you to set the size of the penalty, either large, medium, or small, such that each ligand atom that occupies the excluded volume will incur that penalty. Now because we have the display receptor option on, we can also show the excluded volumes we specified back in grid generation. For this part of the exercise, however, we won't apply any excluded volumes. It is rare that you will need to open the advanced settings, but if you do need further options for controlling the docking process, such as if you are primarily docking fragments, the advanced settings dialog box is where you can make those adjustments. In-depth details covering these settings can be found in the Glide user manual, but perhaps one setting in here that may be of relevance is the selection of initial poses. Checking on this expanded sampling option is particularly useful for fragment docking and screening to ensure that good fragment poses are found.
Under the ligands tab, we can specify the source of ligands to be docked. Now, as explicitly stated here, we strongly recommend that you prepare the ligands first, for example with LigPrep and Epic. Here, you can choose which ligands to use from either the workspace, if you have the ligand in the workspace, the selected entries in the project table, or in this case, we'll be choosing them from a file. So, we'll click Browse and import the file 50ligs.mae.gz. Now, this file contains 50 unique ligands. Partial charges for the ligand are obtained from the force field, but if you want to use pre-generated partial charges for some other source, you can check on this option. If you attempted to do this, you may be interested in the QM Polarized Licking Docking Solution, as it provides a way of using quantum mechanical charges from a Q-site calculation to dock ligands. Now here, we have options to restrict the type of ligands to be docked based on the number of atoms or rotatable bonds that are in each ligand. The defaults are fine, but if, for example, you had a small binding site or wanted small ligands, or maybe even more rigid ligands when screening a large database, then you could reduce these values. Just like in the grid generation panel, where we had the option to scale van der Waals radii for receptor atoms to decrease penalties for close contacts, here we can similarly soften the potential, but for non-polar ligand atoms. Now you'll note the default scaling factor is already set to 0.8, which means we're already modeling a slight give during binding. But if you wanted to turn van der Waals radii scaling off, then you'll set this value to one. Here, we'll use the defaults. If you have a receptor in which there is substantial movement upon docking, such as in sidechain confirmation, backbone location, or loop confirmation, you should consider docking to multiple protein confirmations, which means setting up multiple grids, or to use the induced fit protocol to account for protein flexibility. Now, in this part of the exercise, we won't apply any other settings, such as core constraints or any other constraints, including those that we set up during grid generation. We'll demonstrate them in a later exercise. For now, we'll just skip right through to the output tab. Here, we can specify the type of file to create for the output ligand poses. In this case, we'll create a pose viewer file, which includes the receptor. The output file will be in maestro format. We won't put a limit on the number of poses to report, but this could be useful if you wanted to limit the number of predicted best binding poses written. We'll write out only one pose per ligand, which is fine for database screening applications. However, a larger choice may be appropriate for lead optimization studies or whenever several reasonable poses are wanted. For example, to generate a variety of docked poses for post-docking programs. Though keep in mind that if you have a small binding pocket or ligands with few rotatable bonds, choosing a large number might simply retain poor poses. We'll ensure post-docking minimization is selected with the default number of poses per ligand. This performs minimization in the field of the receptor to produce better poses and only adds a small amount of time. Although if the binding pocket is small or the ligands fairly rigid, then post-docking minimization will not improve the results for poses that do not fit or that are already poorly aligned to the receptor. Here is an option to calculate and apply strain correction terms. We won't use it here, but these terms are evaluated by optimizing each ligand pose as a free ligand first with constraints on all torsions, then without these constraints. The difference is used to compute a penalty term for unreasonably high strain. Next, we'll optionally write per residue interaction scores for residues within 12 angstroms of the grid center. This can be useful for examining interactions between the ligand and individual nearby receptor residues. Okay, now to summarize what we've done in setting up this docking job, we have defined the receptor grid that we'll be docking into, as well as the docking precision and sampling settings. We've defined the ligands that we'll be docking. We won't apply any constraints or similarity settings. Instead, we'll revisit those options in a later exercise. And we've set up the output settings. So next, all we need to do is rename the job. And then we can either click Run, or we can click and hold the Job Settings button. So here we can specify the results to be incorporated into the project table, appended as a new group, and we can separate the job into multiple subjobs. In this case, we'll use 10 subjobs. Now, if there are 50 ligands to dock, then that means in each subjob, there will be five ligands being docked. And here we have four processors on the local host, so we'll use all four of them. So in this case, the 10 subjobs will be distributed over the four processors. When ready, we'll click Save and Run. The job should only take a couple of minutes.